Hello and welcome to Mr. Tompkins EdTech and a brand new series of videos aimed at helping you prepare for your GCSE mathematics exams. In this series I'll be giving a complete walkthrough of the GCSE mathematics practice papers to help you prepare for your exams this summer. Now there are not so many of these and you don't want to squander them so make sure you try the paper yourself first before you look at these solutions. This particular paper is OCR GCSE Mathematics June 2018, Paper 5, Higher Tier. Check the front cover of your paper to make sure it's the same one. If it's not, have a look through the playlist linked above which includes all the GCSE Maths video walkthroughs I've recorded so far. I'm busy recording all of the GCSE uh, practice papers, so if the one you're looking for isn't there already, why not subscribe by clicking the big red button below and check back in a few days. Don't forget to click on the bell so that you'll get a notification when I upload the next paper. I'll put timestamps in the description below so you can choose to watch the whole thing through or you can click on the timestamp and jump to the particular question you need help with. If you have a question, check the comments below as someone else might have already asked the same thing. If it's a new question, Leave it in the comments and I will try and answer all of them as soon as I can. Don't forget to mention which question on the paper you're referring to and try and be as specific as possible. Finally, if this video helps you with your revision, please give it a thumbs up. It will really help me out and why not share the link with your friends because they might need a helping hand too. Okay, let's get into it. Welcome along to another OCR GCC Mathematics past paper walkthrough. Today we're going to be looking at the June 2018 paper 5. This is the non-calculator higher tier paper. Um, so let's get cracking. Question 1a. Calculate 3 fifths plus 5 eighths. Okay, so we're adding fractions together here, but you'll notice that we've got a different denominator. We've got a 5 here and an 8 here. So to add them together, we need to find a common denominator. So what's the common multiple of 5 and 8 then? Uh, the smallest one I can think of is, well, it's just 5 times 8. It's 40, isn't it? So let's times the first fraction, top and bottom, by 8. And the second fraction, top and bottom, by 5. What's that going to give me? So that's going to give me 3 times 8 is 8, 16, 24, 40 plus Plus 5 times 5 is 25, 25, 40 ths. So now I've got two numbers with the same denominator. I can simply add the numerators together then. So the 24 plus the 25, uh, that gives me 49 over 40. Okay, so that's an improper fraction. And in a lot of cases, that would be perfectly acceptable. Uh, it's just that in this particular case, it's asking me to express it as a mixed number, uh, not as an improper fraction. So uh, we're going to convert this into a mixed number by saying how many times does 40 go into 49? It goes in once and the remainder is 9, so it's 1 and 9 fortieths. Just double check, have we got any common divisors of 9 and 40? Nope, don't think so. So I think we're done, so it's 1 and 9 fortieths. Question B, work out 5 times 10 to the 4, subtract 1.6 times 10 to the 3, give your answer in standard form. Okay, so similar to the last question where we couldn't add or subtract our fractions unless they had a common denominator. Uh, if you want to add or subtract uh, numbers in standard form, it's handy to have this last part here uh, the same, the power of 10 the same. And you'll notice they're different in this case. I've got 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 3. Uh, but 10 to the 4 is just 10 times 10 to the 3. So I can take a 10 out of 10 to the 4 and instead multiply. Uh, so if I reduce that by 1, I can times the, the mantis part, the number part, by 10. Uh, so that's going to give me 50 times 10 to the 3, subtract 1.6 times 10 to the 3. Now notice now that the exponent part, the power of 10, is the same in both. So that means I can just subtract uh, the mantis part, the number part at the front, one from the other. So 50 subtract 1.6, uh, well, that's 49, 48.4, isn't it? So that's going to give me 48. 0.4 times 10 to the 3. Okay, are we done? Not quite. It asks us to put our number in standard form, and this is not in standard form. 
because my number part at the front is not a number between 1 and 10. So again, I'm going to take that 10 out that I multiplied it through by a, a minute ago. Uh, so they're going to divide the mantis by 10. So it's going to give me 4.84 and kind of combine it in with the 10 to the 3. So 10 to the 3 times 10 is 10 to the 4. Okay, so now my number is in standard form. I've got the first part of the number as a number between 1 and 10, and then I'm multiplying through by a power of 10. Good, let's move on. Question 2. Gemma's solution to the inequality 3x plus 1 is greater than negative 5 is shown on the number line. Is Gemma's solution correct? Explain your reasoning. Okay, well in order to see if she's right or wrong, we're going to have to work it out, aren't we? So I've got 3x plus 1 is greater than negative 5. Now you can solve inequalities similarly to how you solve equations, just got to remember to do the same thing to both sides. So I can subtract 1 from both sides to give myself. So on the left hand side that plus 1 and that minus 1 is going to cancel each other out, it's going to leave me with 3x and that's greater than minus 5 subtract 1 is negative 6. Dividing through both sides by 3 and that leaves me with x is greater than negative 2. Okay. So let's have a look at what Gemma did. She she put a open circle at negative two. Now that is correct. Uh, our kind of limit, our our limit of accuracy there is at negative two, uh, and it should be an open circle because I've got strictly greater than, not greater than or equal to. But she's got the line going off in the wrong direction. What she's actually drawn there is x is less than negative two. Now I want the arrow going the opposite way. Okay, so is Gemma's solution correct to explain your reason? Uh, I'm going to say Gemma is wrong. Her arrow points in the wrong direction. Okay, Gemma is wrong. Her arrow points in the wrong direction. Question 3a, work out column vector negative 3, 2 plus column vector 5, 7. Now when you are adding, subtracting column vectors, you add and subtract um, the same spot in both. So I'm going to, that minus 3 there, that's the x value, isn't it? Uh, and I'm going to be adding that to the 5 there in the second um column vector and negative 3 plus 5 is 2 and then I'm going to be adding the 2 and the 7 together 2 plus 7 is oops is is and 2 plus 7 is 9 okay so the yellow ones gave me that one the green ones gave me that one okay part B Got a similar uh, thing here, except I'm subtracting then. The rules of subtraction are the same as rule for adding, subtract like from like. Uh, but I've also got a scalar in front of my second um, column vector. I've got that 2 sitting on the outside there that I've got to deal with first. Now basically everything inside the vector gets multiplied by 2. So that gives me 3, 4, subtract. 2 lots of 1 is 2, and 2 lots of negative 3 is negative 6. Okay, uh, just as last time, now we're now going to add the two top numbers together, and, well, I subtract, sorry, uh, the two bottom numbers together. So 3 subtract 2 is going to give me 1, and 4 subtract negative 6 is going to give me 10. So... The two yellow ones gave me that one, and the two green ones gave me that one there. Okay, so that's my answer. 10, sorry, 110. Question 4. Here is the nutritional information for a 110 gram serving of cereal. Carbohydrates, 99.4 grams. Proteins, 9.5 grams. Fats, 1.1 gram. Emily says that more than 90% of this serving is carbohydrates. Is she correct? Explain your reasoning. Okay, well... Maybe I should just find what 90% of 110 grams is, and then I can compare it with the carbohydrate score and see if she's right. Uh, so, I'm going to do a percentage without a calculator. So let's start with 100% being 110. So if 100% 100 is 110 grams, uh, if I want to find 90%, probably the easiest way is find 10% and subtract it then, isn't it? 
So 10% of 110 is 11. Uh, and then if I subtract 10% from 100%, I'll get 90%. And 110 subtract 11 then is 99. So 90% of 110 grams is 99 grams. Now in the question, we're told that carbohydrates in this cereals is 99.4 grams, which is slightly more than 90% then. So is Emily is correct? Yes, she is. So yes, Emily is correct. 99 grams is more than, oh sorry, 99.4 grams, isn't it? 99.4 grams is more than 90%. Question five, the table shows the relative frequencies of the results for a football team after a number of games. And we've got the results of the game, which you can see are either one lost or draw, and their relative frequencies, which is 0 0.2, 0 0.45, uh, and a mystery score for draw. Uh, we need to complete the table. In other words, we need to work out what the relative frequency was of getting the draw. Uh, now, because win, loss, uh, win, lose, and draw represents all the possible outcomes for the game, then these three relative frequencies need to sum to one. So the two I've been given, 0.2 plus my 0.45 plus my mystery score, let's call that x, that is going to add up to 1. Okay, so if I then, um, well, 0 0.2, 0 0.2 plus 0.45 is 0.65, uh, and then subtracting 0.65 from both sides to get x by itself. I can see that my missing value there then is 0.35. Okay, so my x value up there is 0.35. Okay, uh, the team lost 10 more games than they won. How many games did the team play altogether? Ah, okay, so they won enough games so that their relative frequency came out to be 0.2 and they lost enough games so their relic frequency came out to be 0 0.45 and then the difference between them is 10 so if I take the difference from their relative frequencies away from each other 0 0.45 subtract 0 0.2 that 0 0.25 should represent uh, 10 matches okay so if 0 0.25 is 10 matches then there must have been 40 matches altogether. Okay, and if there's 40 matches in total, oh, that's it then, isn't it? Question six. Jack sent 15% more text messages in March than in February. Jack sent 460 text messages in March. How many more texts did Jack send in March than in February? Okay, so we've got a percentage change question here. Um, I like to do percentages using uh, this triangle, F, O, M, where F stands for final, O is original, and M is multiplier. Okay, so the final is the amount after the percentage change. So uh, that is going to be in the March score then, isn't it? So the final amount is 460 texts. The original is going to be the amount of text before the, the percentage change. And that's what we're trying to find, isn't it? So that's the value we want. And M is the multiplier. So if you start off with 100% and then you add 15% to it, that is 115%, which as a multiplier is 1.15. Okay? Uh, so you can see the thing we want to find is the original. This is a, what we call a reverse percentages, a reverse percentage question, isn't it? So what you do with the triangle is then you stick your thumb on the one that you want to find, in this case the O, uh, and the other two tell you how to find it then. So the original is equal to the final divided by the multiplier. Uh, final is 460, multiplier 1.15 which would be super easy if you had a calculator. Uh, we don't have a calculator. How many times does 1.15 go into four, 460 then? 
Well, if you double up 1.15, you're going to get 2.3, and you double it again, you're going to get 4.6. So I'm thinking that goes in 400 times. So that makes 400 texts in February. Question 7. Here is the floor plan of a rectangular room. Tim buys carpet tiles for this room. Each tile is a square measuring 50 centimetres by 50 centimetres. The tiles are only sold in packs of 10. Each pack costs £20. Tim pays for, the sit pays for a fitting at a rate of £7.50 per square metre with any fraction of square metre rounded up. Work out the total cost of the fitting. Okay, so there's quite a lot of information here and I think we're going to have to use all of it, aren't we? Uh, try and be quite systematic as we go through this. It's a six marker. Uh, so let's start off with the dimensions of the room then. How big is the room? Uh, well, it's three meters by 4.5 meters. Uh, I think rather than working out the area, I'm just going to work out how many, how many tiles I can actually fit into this space. So with three meters, I'm going to be able to fit six tiles this direction, this direction, aren't I? Then if uh, they're 50 centimeters each, it means I can fit two in a meter. So I can fit six tiles in three meters. And in this direction, I've got 4.5 meters, which is nine tiles, isn't it? Okay, so I'm gonna need six tiles times nine tiles. So six times nine, that comes out to be 54 tiles. So I need 54 tiles to tile a room. Okay, the tiles are only sold in packs of 10. Well, that means I can't buy 54 tiles. I'm gonna to have to buy 50 tiles, which is too few, or 60 tiles, which is slightly too many. Okay, so I'm going to use, I'm gonna buy six packs, aren't I? I'm gonna buy six of those then. Uh, each pack costs 20 pounds. So, uh, let's, let's start writing down what I need then. So the number of tiles, we said was six times nine, which was 54. And that is roughly 60 tiles rounded up then, aren't I? Because I can't round down, otherwise I won't have enough tiles. Okay, so that's roughly 60 tiles. Uh, so cost of tiles. Uh, they are 20 pounds each, aren't they? So 20 pounds for a pack of 10. So it's 60 tiles divided by 10 is six times 20, six twenties is 120 pounds then, isn't it? Okay, so I've used this information, I've used this information, I've used this information. Tim pays for fitting at a rate of seven pound 50 per square meter with any fraction of square meters rounded up. Okay, so I know the cost of the tiles, now I need to do the cost of the fitting. So uh, I need the area now in square meters of the whole room uh, so area of room that's going to be my three meters times the 4.5 meters uh, so 4.5 4.5 and 4.5 so it's 9 13.5 isn't it 13.5 square meters but again i can i have to round that up don't i because i can't uh, i have to fit the half meter at full price so again i'm going to round that up to 14 square meters. So cost of fitting then is going to be my 14 square meters times the cost of £7.50 per square meter. Okay, 14 times £7.50. Um, so what's 14 times £7.50? 10 £7.50s is £75. And four seven pound fifty double double and double again seven fifty fifteen thirty quid isn't it? So it's seventy five pounds and thirty pounds, which is a hundred and five pounds. So the cost of fitting is a hundred and five. So then the total cost then is going to be going to be the cost of the tiles plus the cost of the fitting. So add those two together then. So one twenty plus. 105 which comes out to be 225 pounds okay that's my final answer 225 
Question 8. Hannah wants to display all the possible outcomes when rolling two fair six-sided dice. Give a reason why a tree diagram is not the best method to use. Well, in a tree diagram, you're doing a branch, aren't you, for every possible outcome. So when you throw the first dice, you're going to have six possible outcomes. So if you were going to draw this as a tree diagram, you'd have one, two, three, four, five, six different branches like that. And then each of your branches is then going to have six more branches. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. So it's going to it's going to be like a forest, not a tree, isn't it? So there's so many branches at the end, it's just just confusing so uh, the reason why I wouldn't use it is that it is too many branches so draw a sample space uh, to display all the possible outcomes that's a much more sensible idea isn't it now a sample space uh, you're going to have a table and you're going to have a column for each outcome from one event and a row for each outcome from the other. So uh, I can get a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, or a six on my first dice. I can get a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, or a six on my second. Now, what you put in the middle depends on what the question is. Now, if it was the sum of the two dice, uh, then you'd put the sum in the middle. So one plus one is two. Uh, if you were subtracting, one subtract one would be zero. Uh, so it really depends. Now in this case, I can see in the next question that we're looking at adding them together. So I'm going to put the sums in the middle here. So one plus one is two, one plus two is three, four, five, six, seven. Two plus one is three, two plus two is four, five, six, seven, eight. Three plus one is four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, so that's my uh, sample space for adding the two scores together. And then in the last part here, it says show that the probability of the score of the two dice adding to 11 is 1 over 18. Okay, well, there are 36 outcomes altogether. Now, probability is equal to successful outcomes over total outcomes, isn't it? That's the definition of probability. In this case, there are 36 different outcomes, each one of those numbers in the sample space. 6 times 6 is 36. So that's the number on the bottom. Uh, and how many 11s can we see? Well, I can see one there and one there so that's two altogether so there are two successful outcomes out of 36 uh divide the bottom, top and bottom by two that's going to give me my one over 18 as uh, as requested question 9a complete the table for y equals x cubed minus 3x so this is a cubic equation uh, most of the values in the table have been given i've just got one one to find here isn't it when um when x is minus one Okay, so let's sub that into the equation and see what we get. When x equals minus 1, then y is going to be minus 1 cubed. Subtract 3 lots of minus 1. So negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1. Negative 1 times negative is positive, times a negative is negative again. So that's minus 1. And I've got negative 3 times negative 1, which is positive 3. Negative 1 plus 3. I make that 2. Okay, so that is the number that goes there. Negative 1 goes with 2. Okay, so now I've got all the points. I can draw the graph of y equals x cubed minus 3x for uh, x line between minus 3 and positive 3. I'm just going to plot these points on the graph. So minus 3 minus 18, where's that then? So I've got 10 squares between minus 15 and tw minus 20. So it's going to be like two little squares is one division then, isn't it? Uh, so it's going to be something like that, isn't it? So minus 18 then, reading across from that. Six little squares down and across is a, is a point there. Minus 3, eight, minus 18. Next one, negative 2, negative 2. So again, let me just put some 
marks on this scale, otherwise I can't read it. don't really like this graph paper from OCR. Hard to use. So minus 2, minus 2 is going to be there. And then we've got minus 1, 2. So let's put some marks on this scale here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So t minus, minus 1, 2 is going to be Uh, what have we got now? Zero, zero. Uh, one minus two. Two, two. I'm going to end high three, eighteen. So fifteen. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So 18 is going to be that row there. Horrible graph paper. Okay, it's quite small on my computer, so do excuse me if I've gone a bit wonky. And they're going to join it up with this distinctive curve you get for cubics. Okay. Now you need a smooth continuous curve. Uh, you get marked down for things like feathering, so like more than one line, and not going through each of your points would get you a deduction, I think. Uh, but it should end up looking something like that. Okay, part C says use your graph to solve x cubed minus 3x uh, is equal to, that's a typo, it should be 10. Um, okay, so using a ruler, finding 10 on our output value, our our y value and reading across to the curve. You get to the curve, change direction, head downwards. Okay, the answer I want is there, isn't it? So that is about two point seven so I'm gonna say that x equals two point seven you probably get one either way I should imagine from there depends on how you draw your curve but for my graph it's coming out to be about two point seven question ten if son noticed this information on her car's dashboard at the start of her journey she started her journey with a full tank of fuel and her miles traveled set to zero work out how far if car can travel on a full tank of fuel. Okay, so at the point in the journey that we've been given, we can see that she's traveled 165 um, miles, and we can see that the petrol gauge is still up here, isn't it? So how many divisions is that? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight divisions uh, between empty and full. So, uh, and she's got five divisions still uh, to go. So she's got five eighths of her fuel left. Another way of thinking about it is that she's used up three fifths of her fuel then, hasn't she, between uh, so far in the journey. So in, with using three fifths of her fuel, she can travel 165 kilometers. So I'm going to write that down as a ratio, I think. So percentage of the tank used, 3 eighths, that goes with 165 miles then. Now we want to know uh, how far it can go on a full tank, which is 1 to something then, isn't it? So how do we go to from 3 eighths to something to 1 to something? Okay, well if we divide through by 3, we'll get one eighth. And then if we multiply through by eight, uh, well eight, we'll get eight eighths, won't we? Okay, so three eighths divided by three is one eighth, and one eighth times eight is one. So let's do that to the other side as well. Uh, so to first divide it by three, 165 divided by three. Well, I know that 150 is three times 50 and 15 is three times five. So that's got to be 55, isn't it? 
165 divided by 3 is 55. So that means we can go 55 miles on an eighth of a tank of petrol. So then scaling that up then to a full tank, you've got multiple apply through by 8 then. So 8 lots of 50 is 400 and 8 lots of 5 is 40. So I'm reckoning she can do 440 miles on a full tank. 440 miles on a full tank. Okay, part B says, what assumptions have you made when answering part A? Uh, well, I think what I'm assuming is that this car uses petrol at a constant rate um, every one eighth of a division on the fuel gauge. Uh, it travels 100 and, well, 55 miles we worked out, didn't we? So we're assuming that that is a constant throughout and, you know, an eighth at the top of the scale is equivalent to an eighth at the bottom. So I'm going to say that petrol consumption is constant throughout journey. Okay. Question 11. The diagram shows two right angle triangles ABD and BCD sharing a common side BD. AD we're told is 10, BC is 12, and the angle DBC is 60 degrees. Work out the length of AB. Okay. Now we've got right angle triangles here. If we know any two pieces of information in a right angle triangle, we can we can find any of the other information of it, either using Pythagoras theorem or uh, trigonometry. Uh, we're wanting to find the length AB, which is this line here. But in the in the triangle ABD, where that triangle that line is part of, we've only got one bit of information at the moment. We've only got that ten degrees there. So in order to work out AB, we need to know another piece of information in triangle ABD. And where's that going to come from? Well, uh, if you look at the other triangle, uh, BDC, uh, we've got two bits of information in there. We've got its length here, and we've got its angle here. Okay, so those two pieces of information should be enough to work out any other bit of information. Now, these two triangles have a side in common. It's this side here, BD. So the strategy here is going to be Use the first triangle uh, BDC where I know two bits of information to find BD. Once I've found BD, I know two bits of information in the other triangle ABD, and then I can go on and find AB. Okay? So we're going to start off using the right hand triangle. So I'm going to say in triangle BCD. And I'm just going to draw a quick sketch of that. I'm going to take that information out of the diagram and draw it down here. I know that, that is 60, and I know that is 12 centimeters. Right, so it's trigonometry here, isn't it? And I've got the hypotenuse, and I want the adjacent, uh, and I've got the angle, haven't I? So which ratio are we going to be using? So using our handy mnemonic SOCATOA, which one are we using here? A and H is there and there, look, it's the cosine we need. So I'm gonna use the cosine ratio. Cos theta is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. Okay, then we're gonna put in the information from the diagram into that calculation. So cos 60 equals adjacent, which is the thing we're trying to find. Let's just call that BD, divided by the hypotenuse which we know is 12. Okay, now this is the non-calculated paper. So I'm a bit, a bit of a pickle here really, haven't I? Because I, don't, I, have, I can't just type in cos 60 into my calculator. But luckily, before I came into the exam, I memorized all of the exact values that we're meant to know for this, ex uh, for this exam. So having a look at this table, uh, where I've got all the different values for sine, cosine, and tangent, for the angles 0, 30, 45, 60, and, uh, and 90. Uh, these are all the ones you have to remember for your exams. So cos 60, 
I can see from this table is a half, so I can replace cost 60 with a half. I can say a half is equal to BD over 12. So then cross multiplying my 12, then I'm multiplying both sides by 12. I'm going to get BD is 12 over 2, which is 6, isn't it? So that means BD is equal to 6 centimeters. Okay. Now, once I know BD is 6, I can switch over to the other triangle. So in triangle, uh, what we've got now? We've got ABD, haven't we? In triangle ABD, uh, and if I quickly sketch that, then I've now got BD, which is worth 6 centimeters, and I know that te that's 10. So I've got a nice, well, I've got an equilateral triangle where I know two sides and I want a third side. That's Pythagoras' theorem, isn't it? Uh, and what's more, I've got two sides of a P Pythagorean triple. Um, most common Pythagorean triple is 3, 4, 5. Uh, and then you've, you can have multiples of that, can't you? So 6, 8, 10, and so on. And that's what we've got here. If I've got a, a 6 and a 10, then the other one is going to be an 8. So I know that, that one up there must be 8. Uh, so, how am I going to write that down? So I'm going to say that uh, a b squared equals 10 squared subtract 6 squared, uh, which is, so that makes a b equal to 8. Okay, I don't really need to work it out, I can just use it from the Pythagorean triple. Questions. Question 12. Carol says that 64 to the power of negative a half equals 1 over 32. Explain her error and give the correct value of 64 to the power of negative a half in the form of P over Q. Okay, so what's she done here then? So I've got 64 to the power of negative 1 half. Now you can treat this as two separate operations. I've got this negative sign and I've got a denominator of two, and I can treat those as two separate steps. When you've got a negative index, that just means one over the same value to the positive index. So I've dealt with the minus sign by putting it as, as the reciprocal. So 64 to the power of minus a half is the same thing as one over 64 to the power of half. And any power uh, of a half, that is the same thing as the square root then of that number, so that's the square root of 64. And the square root of 64 is equal to one over eight. Okay, so that should be the answer, one eighth. Now what has she done? So if she got to, well she's, she's used the negative sign correctly to flip it over, but then she's multiplied 64 times a half rather than finding the square root. So that's her error. So that's what I'm gonna write down there. Uh, so I'm gonna write Carol, has multiplied 64 times a half to get 32 uh, when she should have square rooted root 64 equals 8. Okay, that's what she's done wrong. Question 13a, write 5 twelfths as a recurring decimal. Okay, well 5 twelfths is the same thing as 5 divided by 12. So if I'm going to write um, this as like using long or short multiplication, so 12 into 5, how many times does that go? Well, it doesn't, but if I put 5.0, let's put some extra zeros in here. Uh, so 12 into 5 doesn't go, it goes in zero times. Uh, so that means I would carry the 5 over, wouldn't I? So get 50. 12 into 50 goes 4 times. Uh, so I would write 4 up here. 4 12s are 48. 50 subtract 48 is 2. So my carry forward would be 2. Uh, and then 12s into 20 go once. Once. Uh, and that's got a remainder of 8. Okay, 12s into 80, 
How many times is that? That's, uh, that's got to be six times, isn't it? So six times, six twelves are 72. That gives me a remainder of, well, that's where I get the repeating thing because that gives me another eight, doesn't it? Okay, and then after that, I'm just going to get eights, 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 eights. So this is where it repeats six, 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 six and so on. So we can say that 5 over 12 is the same thing as 0 0.416 with a little dot on the top then. In part B we need to go the other way, so convert 0 0.76 reoccurring to a fraction. Okay, so I'm going to say let x be equal to our uh, recurring decimal, so that's seven six seven six seven six seven six and so on. So if that is true, then a hundred x is going to be that same number times by a hundred, which would be seventy six point seven six seven six seven six and so on. So then, if I then subtract one from the other, so I'm going to kind of subtract uphill. So 100x subtract x, that is going to give me 99x. And 76.767676, I wrote a 7 there, that was naughty me. Let me just do that properly. 767676. Then these, these numbers here are going to cancel with these ones, and it's just going to leave me with 76. So I know that 99x is equal to 76, uh, and then it's just division through by 99 and that tells me that x must be then 76 over 99 that's my final answer question 14 a diagram shows a cylinder and a cone the cylinder has a radius of two centimeters and a height of nine centimeters the cone has a radius of r centimeters and a height of h centimeters the ratio of r to h is one to four the volume of the cone is equal to the volume of the cylinder work out the value of r. Okay, uh, and we've been helpfully given the, the volume of a cone formula there, if you didn't know it already. Okay, let's start off with the cylinder then. What's the volume of the cylinder? So the volume of the cylinder is, well, it's a, it's a prism, isn't it? Uh, it's a prism with a, a circular cross-section the area of a cross section, the area of the cross section is the area of a circle, which is going to be pi r squared uh, times the distance between them, pi r squared h. So that's the formula we're going to be using. Uh, so what's r? r is two, h is nine. So that's pi times two squared times nine. Two squares is four. Four times nine is thirty-six. So the volume of the cylinder then is going to be thirty-six pi. Okay. Right, and I, so I now know that's got to be the same as the volume of the of the cone as well. Uh, now, the cone, we're told, has a ratio of r to h, uh, which is in the ratio of 1 to 4. Now, the volume of the cone um, involves both r and h. Uh, but if we can find h in terms of r, then we'll just have something all in terms of r. And we can then solve it for r, and then we can then work out what h is after that. I think that's probably the easiest way to proceed. So using this um, ratio, r, r to h is 1 to 4, that tells me that um, r over h is 1 over 4. So rearranging that, uh, cross multiplying my h up here and my 4 up here, that tells me that h equals 4r. Okay, so I'm going to use that uh, to replace h in my volume of a cone formula uh, and then make that equal to what we, what we just found, 36 pi. So I'm going to say the volume of cone, that's one third of the area of the base, pi r squared times h, uh, which we just said 
is the same thing as one third times pi r squared times four four r because I'm I know that h is the same thing as four r. Uh, so that's given me four thirds of pi r cubed then. And then that we know must be equal to the same thing as the cylinder, which is equal to 36 pi. Okay, uh, now I can cancel the pi's out of this. So that pi cancels with that pi. So I've got four thirds of r cubed is equal to 36. So four thirds of r cubed then must be equal to 36. So multiplying both sides by three and then dividing both sides by four. So moving that up there, that down there, I'm gonna get r cubed. What's 36 divided by four? 36, so four's into 36 go nine times and then times three, nine is um, 27, isn't it? So r cubed is 27 making r the cube root of 27, r must be equal to 3. And if r is 3, then h must be 4 times 3, which is 12. Okay? Is that what we needed to do? The volume of the cone, so what do we need to do? Work out the value of r. Okay, well we did. I just did h as well as a little bonus. Okay, it's good. Question 15, n is a positive integer. Prove that 13n plus 3 plus 3n minus 5 times 2n plus 3 is a multiple of 6. Okay, so let's just kind of remove the brackets and collect like terms to see what we've got to start with. Uh, so doing uh, foil or first outside inside last on this quadratic at the end, what am I going to get? I'm going to get, well I've still got my 13 plus, 13n plus 3 that I started with. Plus then, I'm going to have 3n times 2n, which is 6n squared. I'm going to get 3n times 3, which is 9n. Minus 5 times 2n, which is minus 10n. And negative 5 times 3, which is minus 15. Okay. Uh, so, I've got one term in n squared. So I can write that at the front. 6n squared. I have got several terms in n, 13n plus 9n take away 10n. Uh, so 13 plus 9 is 22, take away 10 is 12. So that's plus 12n. And then the number parts or the constant, I've got a plus 3 and a minus 15. 3 take away 15 is minus 12 then, isn't it? Okay. So you noticed each one of these terms is a multiple of 6. So I can factorize out 6 out of each of them. So 6 times n squared plus 2n minus 2 if I factorize 6 out. And there we go. That's where it that's what we've got. We've got 6 times our n squared plus 2n minus 2 then, isn't it? So if n is an integer, then n squared plus 2n minus 2 is also an integer. Okay, and so, so 6n squared plus 2n minus 2 is a multiple of 6. Question 16. A, B, C and D are all points on the circumference of a circle. PQ is a tangent to, circle, uh, to the circle at D and angle BDQ is equal to 72 and angle BD, B, ABD is 63. And we need to work out the angle X and give a reason for our answer. Okay. Uh, let's just double check that all the information given in the in the text is on the diagram. So I've got the points A, B, C, and D. They're all marked on my diagram, aren't they? 
So that means A, B, D, uh, A, B, C, D is what we call a cyclic quadrilateral then, isn't it? Okay, so this A, B, C, D and back to A again is a cyclic quadrilateral. So we've got some, some circle theorems about that. Uh, PQ is a tangent to the circle at D. Okay, so there's my tangent PQ along there. Uh, and then angle BDQ is 72. So angle BDQ is that one down there then, isn't it? The 72. And ABD 63 up here is that one. Okay, so that's that's all on the diagram. Just It's always worth double checking because sometimes they leave it out. Uh, and now we need to find angle X. Okay, so to find angle X, how are we going to do that? Okay, let's just clean this diagram off and, and start and have a look at it again. So we said that PQ was a tangent. Now notice that there's a line drawn from D up to um, up to B, isn't there? So that is a chord drawn at the point of contact with the tangent. And we've got this angle here, which is 72. That's between the tangent and that chord. Okay. Now, the alternate segment theorem says if I subtend an angle from that chord, so here, then that angle there is going to be the same thing as that angle down there. It's called the alternate segment theorem. So that means that angle X is equal to 72 and the reason is because of the alternate segment theorem. Okay. And the second one, I should, well, I should read Y as a typo. So work out the angle Y uh, at the other side of the diagram. Uh, again, I'm going to clean the diagram off here so we can see it a little bit more clearly. But we said that a, B, C, D is a cyclic quadrilateral and X and Y are opposite angles in a cyclic quadrilateral. Okay, so you should know that opposite angles in a cyclic quadrilateral add up to 180. So, uh, so X, which we've just worked out is 72 plus Y is equal to 180, which means which means y then is going to be 180. Subtract 72, which is 108. Okay, so I'm going to say that y is 108 degrees, and the reason for that is they are its opposite x in a cyclic quadrilateral. Question seven, I've got three brackets, x plus a, x plus three, and two x plus one, and we're told that is equal to b cubed, bx cubed plus cx squared plus dx minus 12, and we need to find the values of a, b, c, and d. Okay, so what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna take uh, the, the side with all the brackets, I'm gonna multiply it all out, and I'm gonna compare it with uh, the other side and see if I can work out what the values are by comparing using a technique called comparing coefficients. So let's start by multiplying out these brackets. I'm going to start with the left hand side uh, which is x plus a, x plus 3, 2x plus 1. Okay, now I'm going to do um, foil on the first pair of brackets. First, outside, inside, last or two eyebrows, a nose, and a mouth, whichever way you remember it. So that's going to give me x squared plus ax plus 3x. Plus 3a. And then I need to multiply that by 2x plus 1 still. Okay. So... Uh, now, everything in the first bracket, it's not so easy to collect them together just yet. So everything in the first bracket, I need to multiply with everything in the second bracket. So I'm going to take everything in the first bracket and multiply it first by 2x. So x squared times 2x is 2x cubed. And then ax times 2x 
is 2ax squared. Uh, and then I've got 3x times 2x, which is 6x squared. Uh, and then I've got 3a times 2x, which is 6ax. Okay, so I've multiplied my four terms in the first bracket by 2x. I'm now going to multiply for everything by 1. Uh, so 1 times x squared is, uh, what's that going to be then? That's going to be x squared. Uh, and then 1 times ax is ax. Uh, and then 1 times 3x is 3x. And then 1 times 3a is 3a. Okay, notice I've kind of staggered it as I've gone through because I'm, I'm kind of kind of like use it to help me collect like terms together a little bit. So I've got 2x cubed. I've got 2a x squared plus 6x squared plus another x squared. So that's going to be 2ax squared plus 7x squared. Might have been easier if I'd have written that under that one. Uh, and then I've got 6ax plus ax, which I make to be 7ax. And then I've got a 3x by itself and a 3a by itself. Okay, so going through this a bit more carefully now. Now I've got various terms here in x squared and x cubed and x and constants, which I'm going to kind of group up together. So first off, I've got 2x cubed. I've only got one term in x cubed, so that can just stay as it is at the front. 2x cubed plus, I've got a 2ax squared and a 7x squared. So in terms of what I've got in terms of x squared, I've got a 2a plus 7 lots of x squared, just factorizing the x squared out of those two. Okay, so my 2x cubed is that one. My 2ax squared and my 7ax uh, went into there, look. Uh, and then my next one, got 7ax and 3a, uh, 3x. So those two terms have both got to do with x. So again, I'm going to factorize it. So I'm going to write 7a plus 3 lots of x. So that was that term and that term are included in there. And then finally, I've got a 3a on the end, which is my constant, isn't it? Okay. So I've got four terms now, a term in x cubed, a term in x squared, a term in x, and a constant. Now, if you remember to go back to uh, the right-hand side of this, uh, this equation, I was told earlier that this thing was equal to bx cubed plus uh, cx squared plus dx minus 12. Okay, so I've labeled these a little, uh, kind of highlighted these a little bit in, uh, in precisely. I've got 2 as the coefficient of x cubed uh, for my left-hand side. And my right-hand side, I had a b. Now, if these two expressions are the same, then they've got each part of these has got to be the same. So my 2x cubed has got to match up with my bx cubed, which means b then must be equal to 2. Okay, uh, from looking at the coefficients of x squared, my left hand side had 2a plus 7, and my right hand side has got cx squared, isn't it? So 2a plus 7x squared must be the same thing as cx squared. And so I can also equate those together. I can say that c is equal to 2a plus 7. Uh, and then the next part along, I can see that I've got 7a plus 3 lots of x, and I know that's the same thing as dx, so I can say that d must be equal to 
7a plus 3. Uh, and then finally, I've got 3a, and that is equivalent to 12. So I can say that 3a, oops, 3a equals minus 12. Just need a little bit more working space. Let me just scroll up a little bit. So, uh, 3 equals minus 12, that makes A equal to negative 4. Now, once I know that A is negative 4, I can then find C and D then, can't I? So, A is negative 4. Uh, C is 2 lots of A plus 7. So, subbing in my values of A, uh, 2 lots of minus 4 is minus 8 plus 7 is negative 1, isn't it? So, C is negative 1. And D... D is going to be 7 lots of negative 4. 7 4s are uh, 28. Minus 28 plus 3 is negative 25. So I've got A is negative 4, B is 2, C is negative 1, and D is negative 25. Question 18a. A straight line passes through the point 0, 6 and is perpendicular to y equals 4x minus 5. Find the equation of the line. Given your answer in a form, y equals mx plus c. Okay, uh, let's start with this uh, line that is perpendicular to. Um, so, y y is equal to four x minus five. So that has got gradient. Well, we can just read the gradient out of its equation. It's this coefficient of x, isn't it? So that's got a gradient of four. So I'm going to call it m one. M one is four. So the uh, the gradient of the line we are looking for is perpendicular to that. So our perpendicular line has gradient m2, which would be minus 1 over m1, won't it? Okay, it's the negative reciprocal of your other line. So m2 is going to be minus or a negative a quarter then, okay? So then the equation, so therefore the equation of my line is going to be of form y is equal to minus a quarter of x plus c, where c is the y-intercept, okay? Now we know that line passes through Uh, 0, 6. So we can sub those values in for y and x. So when x is 0, y is equal to 6. So that means subbing those in, 6 is equal to minus a quarter of 0 plus c. So 0 times a quarter, they're going to disappear, aren't they? And it's going to leave me with c is equal to 6. Okay, so therefore, equation of line is going to be y is negative a quarter of x plus 6. Part B says, work out the coordinates of the intersections of the graph y equals 4x minus 5 and y is equal to x squared minus 17. So we've got a quadratic and a linear equation and we're going to have to find the points of intersection. Uh, normally, you should expect to find two, shouldn't you? If you've got a quadratic and a line crossing them, then it's usually going to cross in two places. So, um, yeah, we're expecting two solutions here. Now, if I've got two equations, y is equal to something, and y is equal to another something, then those two somethings must be equal to each other. Uh, so I can write x squared minus 17 this blue bit here must be equal to 4x minus 5. Uh, the green bit, because the y's are equal to each other as well. Okay, so I've got x squared minus 17 is equal to 4x minus 5. Uh, just collect everything over to the other side, so the 4x can move over and the minus 5 can move over. That's going to give me x squared minus 4x, negative 17 plus negative 5. Uh, it's going to become plus, isn't it? It's going to be minus 12 on the end there. So I've got x squared minus 4x minus 12 
equals zero. So I've got a quadratic now in uh, that I can I can find solutions to. Hopefully I can factorize it. So let's see if we can factorize this quadratic then. I've got a coefficient on the end and uh, constant on the end of negative 12, which has factor pairs 1 and 12, 2 and 6, and 3 and 4. And I'm looking for negative 4 in the middle, so two numbers have got a, a difference of 4. So I think it's going to be 2 and 6 then that I need to put in here. Now the last, the last, uh, the constant is negative, so one is going to be plus and one is going to be minus. It's going to have x and x there. I have a plus and a minus, and, and then I'm going to put the 6 and a 2 in. So I'm going to have to make the 6 on this side and the 2 on that side, so I'm going to get negative 4x in the middle. Okay, so I've got x plus 2, x minus 6 equals 0. Uh, so if I've got two things multiplied together equals 0, it must mean that one of those things was 0 or the other one of those things was 0. In other words, x is minus 2 or x is equal to 6. Okay, so they're my two values of x, uh, but I want coordinates here, don't I? It's asking me for coordinates, so I need to find the y coordinate as well. So when x is minus 2, what's y? Okay, y is going to be 4 lots of negative 2 minus 5, just subbing it into the linear equation at the top there. 4 times minus 2 is, that's negative 8, subtract another 5, uh, I'm going to get y is equal to negative 13 there, and on the other one, if I've got y is equal to 4 lots of 6, subtract 5, then 4 6 is a 24, subtract 5 is 19. So uh, my two coordinates then are going to be minus 2 minus 13 and my other one is going to be 6 and 19. Question 19. Kerry records the time taken t minutes to travel to school for a sample of 168 students at her academy. And we've got a frequency table here. Uh, it's got group data on it and we're asked to draw a histogram to represent this information. Now, if you're going to draw a histogram, it is the area of the bars and not the height, which is proportional to the frequency, which means we need to work out frequency density first off, uh, which I'm just going to uh, abbreviate to FD up there. So frequency density is equal to frequency divided by class width. So we need to work out the width of each of these bars first before we can work out frequency density. Now, the first bar goes from 0 to 10. 10 subtract 0 is 10, so it's got a width of 10. The next bar goes from 10 to 20. 20 subtract 10 is 10. Uh, the third bar goes from 20 to 40. 40 subtract 20 is 20. And then finally, the last bar goes from 40 to 80. 80 subtract 40 is 40. So they're the, the widths of each of those bars. So frequency density, I'm going to get by dividing frequency by each of those class widths. So the, for the first one, 54 divided by 10 is going to have a frequency density of 5.4. Uh, the next one, 50 divided by 10, it's going to have a frequency density of 5. The third bar, 44 divided by 20. Well, 44 divided by 2 is 22, and divided by another 10 is 2.2. 2.2, and then finally, uh, 20 divided by 40. That's going to be 0 0.5, isn't it? Okay, so they're my frequency densities. So I'm going to have to plot those on the graph. Let me just zoom in a little bit because they're so small. Okay, so I've just zoomed in a little bit so I can read this graph a little bit more clearly. On the on the y-axis, we're going to get frequency density. Uh, and we saw that the highest value for that went up to 5.6. Now I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 divisions of 10 squares that I can use on these axes. So that can be my frequency density. Then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So then it should all fit on nicely. Okay, so my first bar goes from 0 to 10, and there's a height of 5.4. Okay, so there's my first bar, so it goes from 0 to 10, and there's a height of 5.4. The next bar goes from uh, zero, uh, 10 to 20, and there's a height of 5. Okay, then the third bar is a width of, it goes from 20 to 40, and a height of 2.2. And finally, I've got one going from 40 to 80 with a height of 0 0.5. Okay, so the finished graph looks a bit like this. 
Part B says, Kerry says the longest time that any of these students took to travel to school was 80 minutes. Is she correct? Give a reason for your answer. Okay, well, if you look at the, the histogram again, uh, you can see that the, 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 the last bar does go up to 80. But because the, the data has been uh, kind of grouped together, we've lost accuracy a little bit, haven't we? So we can't be sure exactly what values were they were. We just know that they're between 40 and 80. Uh, so is she correct? I'm going to say no. Uh, we just know it must be between 40 and 80. Uh, and then it says Kerry also claims that 25% of the students at this academy took more than 30 minutes to travel to school. Show how Kerry might have worked out the claim. Now if you remember there were 168 people in this sample uh, so 25% of 168. That's going to be 168 divided by 4, isn't it? 4's into 168? Well, 4's into 160 go 40 times, so it's going to be 42 uh, students, isn't it? Okay, so we want to know um, where those 42 students at the top end of the data might be. Okay, we can see that that top bar, this bar here, uh, if you remember rightly, that contained 20 people, didn't it? So there's 20 in there. And then the next bar along contained 44 people. That would take me up to student uh, number, uh, well, that'd be 64 students in those top two bars. Uh, but we're just looking at the first 42. Uh, so if 20 are in there, we want to find 22 out of these 44 students in the next bar along. So we can we can do that by just dividing this into two, two then. So the area of this bar represents 42 students. So if I halve it down the middle here, look, that means that we've got 22 people in here and 22 people in here. Okay, so then if I add on the these 22 to the 20 people in the bar above, that's my 22 plus 20, that's 42 people, isn't it? That's um, Which is 25%. So we can see from the graph that your 22 people in that and the 20 there all took a time of 30 minutes or more to get to school. So she is correct about that one. So from the diagram, We can see 20 plus 22 equals 42 students took longer than 30 minutes. Which is 25%. Okay, state one assumption that Kerry has make, uh, is making her claim. Finally, it says state one assumption that Kerry has made in making her claim. Uh, well, let's have a think about this. All, all the students at the academy took more than 30 minutes to, oh, okay. Well, what the, 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 the assumption is here then that the sample of 168 students represents the larger group of body. It's the same percentage in the larger group of body. So that's what we're gonna write down. We're gonna say, uh, that the sample of 168 students is representative just wanted to take a few seconds out to talk about my patreon page which you can find at patreon.com stroke mr tompkins edtech uh, on here you can gain access to exclusive content including early access to my past paper walkthroughs. Uh, so if you like my content, definitely worth checking that out. Also, if you become a Pythagorean patron, you get a special shout out in every video. So check it out. Back to the maths.
Question 20. In the following equation, n is an integer greater than 1. And we're told that root 2 to the power of n is the same thing as k, some constant, times root 2. And we need to find k when n is 7. So basically we want to sub in n is 7 into the left-hand side and make it look more like what we've got on the right-hand side. So let's start with the left-hand side, root 2 to the power of 7, or n, which is equal to 7. So root 2 to the power of 7, what's that equal to? Now you can say that root 2 to the power of 7 is the same thing as root 2 to the power of 6 times root 2. Why am I doing that? Because I'm trying to make it look more like that right hand side. So I'm kind of bringing out a root 2 on the end. Okay, uh, And then root 2 to the power of 6, what's that the same as? Well, root 2 is the same thing as 2 to the power of a half. So I've got 2 to the power of half raised to the power of 6 times by root 2. Okay, Now here I've got what's called an index of an index, where I've got half raised to the power of 6. So these two values I would multiply together then, wouldn't I? So 2 to the half raised to the power of 6 is the same thing as 2 to the power of 3. Okay, And 2 to the power of 3 square times root 2. Well, 2 to the power of 3 is the same thing as 8 then, isn't it? 8 root 2. So comparing what I've got now with the right-hand side up here, look, then k must be the same thing as 8. So I'm going to say that k is equal to 8. OK. Part 2 says find n when k is equal to 64. So this time we're going to sub into the right-hand side and try and make it look more like the left-hand side than aren't I. So k root 2 where k is 64, that's going to be going to start with 64 root 2. And I'm going to try and do the opposite of what I just did. First off, let's let's think about 64 as a power of 2. Uh, 2 times 2 is 2 squared, which is 4. Then cubed is 8, 16, 32, 64. So 64 is 2 to the power of 6, isn't it? So I can rewrite 64 as 2 to the power of 6. OK, so 64 root 2 is the same thing as 2 to the power of 6 root 2. But 2 is root 2 times root 2. In other words, it's root 2 squared, isn't it? So again, I'm just trying to make it look more like the left-hand side. So root 2, oops, root 2 uh, squared raised to the power of 6 times root 2. OK, uh, and again, index of an index then here, 2 times 6 is 12. So that's got to be the same thing as root 2 to the power of 12 times root 2. And root 2 to the 12 times root 2, that's just going to be root 2 to the power of 13 then, isn't it? Multiplying two things together with the same base, you add the indices, so that's root 2 to the 13. So that means that n is equal to 13, because I'm finding this number here, which is the same as that one there. Look, so n is 13. OK, finally, uh, show that 14 over 3... Uh, minus root 2 can be written in the form a plus b root 2. OK, so I've got 14 over 3 minus root 2. OK, now I've got a, an irrational denominator here, which I want to rationalize. OK, where you've got one with uh, 3 minus a root like that, we can rationalize it by multiplying it through by its complement, which is 3 plus root 2. So it's the same 3, the same root 2, I just switch the sign over. OK, now if I multiply the bottom by 3 plus root 2, I've got to do the same thing to the top, uh, because 3 plus root 2 divided by 3 plus root 2 is just 1, and multiplying a fraction through by 1 is not going to change its value. But it will change its form, because if I take this first bracket and I multiply it by the second one, I'm going to get 3 times 3, which is 9. I'm going to get minus uh, it's 3 times root 2, which is plus 3 root 2. I'm going to get minus root 2 times 3, which is minus 
3 root 2. So you can see those two things are going to cancel each other out. And then we're going to get minus root 2 times positive root 2, which is minus 2. So on the bottom, on the denominator, those two things are going to cancel out. And it's going to leave me with 9 subtract 2 on the bottom, which is 7. OK, uh, on the top, I've got 14 times 3 plus root 2. So 14 times 3 is 28. 38, 42, isn't it? 42 plus 14 root 2. Okay. So notice at the top I've got 42 and 14. These are both in the 7 times table. I can factorize 7 out of those two terms. 7 times 42 is 6 plus 7 times 2 root 2 is 14 root 2. Okay. And then the 7 on the top is going to cancel with the 7 on the bottom. And it's just going to leave me with that bit on the end then, which is equal to 6 plus 2 root 2. OK, so A is 6 and B is 2. You can find more exam question compilations over here. For more past paper walkthroughs, click down here. If you want to visit my Amazon shop with my recommendations for calculators, revision guides and other maths related stuff, click down here. Good luck in your revision and in your exams and see you again next time.